is good. And uh, just present my slides here. Great. So can everybody see my screen? If not, it should be good. We did a check, so it should be fine. Okay. So today, uh, we just want to welcome everybody again to our first Tolika showcasing of the project outcomes. So we have two sessions. Today is the first session, and the next one will be next week, same time, same place, pretty much. And uh, most importantly, what we're looking forward to today is um, sharing some of the project outcomes and really being able to engage and have conversations about what we've been doing, what everybody else has been doing. It's not only ourselves, of course, it's the makers that have been creating. And the agenda today will be a small introduction by myself, followed by Aziz, who's been running the project for GIG um, with the Tolika team, such as Constantine, as well as everybody from Apopedia, GRZ, and the um, HIWW team. So after that, we'll kick off with Constantine, who you've just heard from briefly, uh, based in Kiev as well, for 10 minutes, talking about the project for the We Arm Prosthetics. Then we have Vuga, who's based in uh, Uganda, and Jan, who's in Ukraine, talking about the rebirth bricks. So we do have a video there and tech, you know, hopefully is on our side today to showcase that to you as well. And then we have Bodan, who's also based in Kiev at the moment to showcase the big pellet 3D printer. And then Emilio, who's in El Salvador, will be showcasing the open source platform where all of the files, documentation and projects are based where we can download, recreate, share, and hopefully um, take more life from the projects that we've all shared and created during this project. So as a quick overview on the side of GIG, we are a unique global network and we have over 150 members across more than 40 countries. And um, what we try and do through this network is really facilitate exchange and the opportunities to co-create. I guess one of the main things, and this is part of the Tolica project as well, is that it's looking at open hardware projects. So it's not for only global, but also local needs. So I guess a little bit of a segue there is local needs, but global and local. And the the connection is that we have these amazing people from makerspaces, from innovators, from individuals, from people across, you know, from the north to the south, you know, working together. And this was part of the project that we worked on together for um, Tolokar. And what we tried to do was to create uh, an exchange, so a co-design challenge where we could connect people from the global gig network, as well as Ukrainians to be able to co-create projects together. Of course, this was a little bit more difficult than we might've at first thought because of language barriers, of course, because of different um, situations and in general, just the difficulties being in Ukraine where not all of us are based, but having you know people like Bodin here as well and Constantine sharing with us what was really going on on the ground and trying our best to be able to facilitate this collaboration um, from as far across as Bangladesh, Scotland, Uganda, the Philippines, Brazil, Kenya, you know, so we tried our, our best to be able to learn from one another and some of the interesting projects that you'll see today and be able to impart some of the skills and knowledge sharing between different countries and different um, territories that go through sometimes similar issues in terms of war-torn um, scenarios, which is less than ideal, but also just sharing, you know, the creative brain and what people are trying to do. So what we did in the project for Tolokar was we matched similar innovative ideas from Ukraine with those from teams that were from the rest of the world and uh, prepared to prototype machines, products, projects from ideation to prototyping and testing and then combining these ideas in an ultimate outcome of what you will see in the projects that are documented in Apopedia, um, which Emilia will tell us a bit more about later in the session today. So with that, I will hand over to our first uh, speaker to introduce, which is Aziz, on behalf of GIG and the Tolica project. So Aziz, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Um, I will share my screen. Please let me know if it's working. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, OK. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Kirsten, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Aziz, and I'm a part of Geek Team. But first of all, I would like to thank you for attending and participating in this session. Uh, in the few coming in, in, in the coming a few minutes, I will give you an overview about Geek's work in supporting the local project. Uh, so, 
the Global Innovation Gathering GIG is providing uh, support to Tolokar project by facilitating collaboration between Ukrainian and global makers. So those connections and bridges transfer knowledge and the skills in and out. So let's say that where a product is thought about in one place and then the prototype in a different place. So in the picture you are like seeing right now, it's what is behind it. In fact, there are a lot of ingredients are mixed together while keeping in mind the concepts of distributed and decentralized manufacturing as they, as they become an essential and important approach, especially when we work in a continuing crisis context. So GIG builds those connections and establishes those bridges for makers to speak with each other and let knowledge flow to build things that matter, while keeping an eye on the future where sustainability and enabling knowledge sharing and re reusing are needed to build communities. Now I'm going to like really quickly uh, give an idea about each project. So like behind each project that you are going to see right now, there is a huge story. Uh, there have been a lot of effort, discussion, investment, and innovation. So let's like, let, let me go quickly uh, talking about each project, the first one, which is business model toolkit. So Yuri and Anna found that financial sustainability is a challenge in all maker spaces. So they decided to do something about it. Roman and Bar, uh, they wanted to make it possible for each maker space to have its own CNC router. Jan and Vuga didn't feel happy about all those debris everywhere, so they wanted to make something useful and did to use those debris in reconstruction. Roman and Bodan thought differently about recycling the plastics, uh, and they decided to do something with, like thinking away from only having those pellets to use those pellets to make something different. Uh, Artem and Annika worked to make something about water supplies using solar energy. Alexandra and Mar Mariana wanted to have their place working stably and share their experience. Konstantin and myself wanted to have an easy solution for those who have hand amputation. Emilio, my friend Emilio, built a great platform where everything is documented and replicable. And even for those who didn't have the chance to build a project, they wanted to share their knowledge through like online workshops where anyone can access and can benefit from those great workshops. Martin and Ravina did something simple and useful to teach, uh, to teach IoT. Uh, Mariana, Sama, and Nauras, uh, they built something to generate and to produce biogas from organic waste. Uh, Saad, he gave an idea or a different approach about working on e-waste, especially about laptops. Rosanna, uh, Rosanna, the great lady, she always thinking about others and she wanted to do something for his children. And finally, uh, Matthew, he wanted to have your own repair uh, lab you can take everywhere. So as you can see, like the diversity we have here. So it's about environment, electronics, administration, health, hardware, water, and much, much more than and everything is documented and can be replicable everywhere. Finally, at the end, I would like go to, to show some numbers, some aggregations, uh, like it's always good and great to have numbers showing things. Although like numbers will not show the complete story, but it's a good idea to show some numbers. So in total, we have 13 countries contributed in this project, like 12 global plus uh, Ukraine, and we have several projects and five workshops. Uh, we have 14 male makers and eight female makers. 
and uh, the percent of global to Ukrainian makers was like 70, 57% to 43%. I think that's it uh, for me right now. Thank you. And back to you, Kirsten. Thank you, Aziz. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, I think everybody uh, gets a bit of an overview of what we've been working on. And it has been uh, quite some months. And I think we're all ready to jump straight into learning a bit more about the We Are Prosthetics. So, Constantine, you're welcome to share your screen and uh, really excited to hear more about what you've been working on and how it will benefit and help. In Ukraine as much as we, we can do together. Thank you, Ziz. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, I think the person most qualified here to talk about we are is Aziz, uh, because he was the one actually building it. Uh, what I can tell a little bit, uh, perhaps, is how it happened to be uh, in the first place, how it came on our radar. Uh, so what I did, I uh, put together a tiny bit of timeline in my notes uh, so let me share uh, basically uh, this uh, poo -poo -poo. I mean probably gonna be the most minimal presentation uh, you guys ever ever come across uh, uh, can you see this these notes yes it looks great yes so I mean that's that's effectively all I should be saying on this uh, maybe then I uh, move a bit to William, but I think Aziz should be the one talking about his adventures. Uh, so what, uh, uh, how it went about is that in uh, on 27th of April, through my colleague, uh, Jean-Michel Molina, uh, through Fab Foundation, uh, he wrote me an email putting me in touch together with Okazu Bell, uh, an inventor from, uh, I think, Stanford University, or maybe Aziz corrects me uh who came up with the low-cost prosthetic solution and that seemed like uh, like a good fit for what Tolaka is doing and that uh, there's definitely a need for low-cost bionic prosthetics in Ukraine but kind of trying to assess where and how this would fit whether this is feasible at all uh, and if we started talking with him and uh, it came it appeared that yes most of his design is closed source uh, which makes it very difficult to to work for us. So we had uh, those conversations. Then it took about a month uh, until uh, Okazu uh, uh, kind of published and uh, reconsidered his uh, his approach in some ways and opened it up. So in in a month's time, he published online documentation uh, with uh, with open source designs for Guiam. Uh, then we took that on board, uh, and it took us about six weeks to just kind of internally communicate, align, find funding opportunities. That's when the gig call was coming about. Uh, that's when uh, kind of uh, we aligned that Aziz's expertise is what we need to uh, to pull off such a project, and that uh, kind of implement Vicky's digital airlift idea. That is that kind of. Basically, to align all these puzzle pieces together, that it would work, that it would take open source design from Stanford, uh, uh, funded through a German project, uh, handed over to uh, electrical engineer in Jordan, so that it would be at some place and time uh, uh, useful for Toloka project in Ukraine. So, kind of shuffling, jiggling all of these pieces together took a while. So, and it was only in the uh, beginning of July 23 as he started working on WeArm, uh, building first prototypes. Uh, in about a month's time, uh, he had printed uh, first parts. He will tell his own story about procurement of electrical components and the rest uh, in Jordan. And it was only in the end of uh, 2023, uh, around 21st of December, Aziz and I had a uh, first call where uh, he showed me his fantastic Capropedia documentation. Uh, and that was uh, tragically around the same time when the operation in Gaza was taking off. So uh, uh, talking to Aziz and uh, seeing the progress that he made while... Um, understanding that he himself is from Gaza, having a lot of friends and family there, gave it kind of extra dimension of uh, significance and meaning. 
Uh, so, but I think Aziz should be the one talking about and sharing this, uh, uh, how he finds uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, so what I can think, uh, I can share a little bit uh, of this screen now instead to kind of show what we went through. Uh, so this was uh, this was the first website that Okazuo sent us uh, with we with William. So it's like a low cost three uh, D printed bionic prosthetic uh, device. But of course, uh, what it comes with is that it requires a great deal of expertise to be able to to build it to implement it. Uh, then this was kind of the open source manual that Okazua shared with Aziz and uh, that Aziz had to kind of update a lot of this stuff, revise it, revisit, uh, adjust, and then ultimately produce these gorgeous uh, build documentation that now currently this is the most up-to-date version, uh, the closest manual to build uh, uh, this device. I don't know, Aziz, if you managed to resolve the ITC communication issues that that were there, but uh, uh, that's that's still kind of. Uh, so now we're looking kind of how to incorporate this uh, this in Ukraine, but just kind of giving a sense of what kind of timeframes it is it takes to take an open source solution developed in one place uh, to get it to any kind of level of readiness or usefulness. Uh, uh, to a uh, situation to be usable in a kind of acute crisis uh, situation here and now. Uh, it's It's been kind of a bit of a reality check for all of us. It takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of expertise. It takes a lot of coordination of a lot of people on different sides to make it possible. So, but that's, that's what we need to strive for in our open source documentation to bring it to the level of detail and expertise that when anybody actually needs it uh that uh, they can they can make them as kind of they can rely on this documentation to be there so uh i think uh aziz did an incredible job uh putting it together uh, documenting it and uh in a way so i'm very much looking forward to make use of this documentation for the next iteration of this of this arm uh, where we create kind of our next puzzle of possibility to to kind of uh, uh, to to make use of this design. So I think Aziz should uh, talk about this uh, further. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Constantine, and I think you you also like raised a very important point that what's happening in Gaza at the moment, and Aziz is based in Jordan and. Having that, it's it's uh, really fundamental that you guys have worked on this project together, coming from the Ukrainian uh, issues and conflict that's been going on, and then having uh, Aziz based in in you know Jordan at the moment, but having the Gaza kind of um, crisis that's happening at the same time that we're able to use these files and able to download them and reproduce them between Ukraine and Jordan and and through the different conflict zones, which is less fortunate than you know we would like it to be but at the same time i think it's really really interesting to see and um aziz as you mentioned updated all these documentations and files and now it's a bit more user-friendly perhaps but as i think those points that you brought up constantine as well that it, it is not so easy when you're going to remanufacture these or create it wherever you are and whether you have a taller car or how you're going to make it there's a lot of things that we all learn through these projects and to figure out how uh, yeah, figure out how best to be able to manufacture these things is something we're all still working on. But Aziz, if you wanted to come in there as well and just add anything on the, the prosthetic that we are, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. I thank you, Constantine, for the, everything you, you have said. Uh, I, I think this project, it was like a great journey. And it was a great, a great things to do. Uh, let's say that, like, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but but I, I really encourage like going into a second iteration of uh, thinking about this project to find something like, like let's say that what, what, what we have done here, that we move this project from being an R&D project in a university to something midway that could be co completed and we could, could be done in a maker space. Uh, so like a second iteration will really add to this project and it will 
like do something useful to it. Especially that like I'm mentioning like things happening in Gaza and as Constance said, I'm from Gaza and like 90% of my relatives are in Gaza and already we, uh, we lost many of them. Like this is the something I'm thinking about right now is to implement this project for people in Gaza because like a lot of amputation is happening right there right now. Uh, thank you everyone and thank you Santin and yeah, enjoy the, the session, thank you. Yeah, stay strong as he said, uh, I think. Thank uh, you, yeah, thank you as well, um, Constantine, for sharing, and uh, we appreciate all the inputs. And let's hope that we get more of these iterations, and that we can implement these, uh, you know, innovations through any anywhere where it needs to be done. So I think that's the most important thing. And thank you for all the hard work. So uh, to Constantine and to Aziz, thank you very much. And uh, we'll hand over now to Jan and to Vuga to present the Rebirth Bricks project. And there will be time for Q and A at the end. So do not fear and feel free to also post anything in the chat. Um, but at the moment, we'll just share all the projects and we have two more and then we'll have some information from Emilio on, on his Wikipedia platform again. And then we have chances to chat and debate and discuss and share. So over to you, Jan, and to Vuga. Hi. Uh, Google, I hear Vuga is here, Jan. We don't see you, but uh, Vuga, if you, I'm not sure which of you will share, otherwise, I can also share. Just let me know this if you want to share the screen. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you start, Vuga? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I think I said our presentation yesterday. Uh, I'm using small phones. Uh, it can be project that be okay on my side. So that I can do the talking. Yes. Hey, Vuga, I'm just uh, going to make it full screen and then you can go ahead. Okay. Just give me one second. My mouse is uh, being uh, technical, which happens. <laughs> Cool. Go ahead. Can we still see your oh. explorer, not the presentation? Okay, that's weird. Thanks for one second. Okay, can you see it now? Wonderful. Awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much. Sorry for inconvenience. And uh, in, in this project, we are two uh, with one of my uh, colleagues who sit in uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, is called Mr. Jan, who I literally prepared a concept based on. Uh, the material that we have, and yeah. this is waste, and we look into how can we turn uh, this to be like a bricks. In the picture that you have seen in the first page, as we have uh, and broken, uh, you know, which is uh, all the 
So the idea we are doing, can we, how can we turn this to be a, a brick can build a house for a complex source like refugees and uh, you can that need a house. So we we share the concept and uh, we we came together. We have online presence where we communicate and look at the different material that everyone has in its area. And for Yen said he used a uh, 3D and of which I did not capture the uh, the pictures, but uh, most of them we have. Uh, uh, we collaborate on the same project. We are we are actually. Uh, uh, make documentations on Wikipedia. And look into this process whereby uh, supported by Tuket and uh, Geek, it has really given for us avenues like uh, young innovators to come together and sit in the difference, how can we collaborate and we learn these uh, new skills and experience and the material everybody uses in different areas. And if you come to the slide two, I actually talk about myself, where I've come from. I've been a refugee for 28 years. And yeah, I think I won't take back to that because uh, what we have seen is that uh, we learn to what we have been doing in the settlements. And when we look at this kind of uh, 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 the material whereby we feel like uh, how can we also take lead to advocate for climate change and that's also giving a move as being refugees it's not that a refugees at the borders that like, like, um, has come with the talents and uh, skill so that we also expose our skills with the uh, network this all happened with toolkit and uh, gigs to bring us together and uh, learn that if you come to slide two uh, slide uh, three, whereby I was moving around looking to how do we turn this uh, huge wasted material into something that we can uh, actually for a bit the community. And when I saw all this, then I have to take the picture and say with the ends at the same time also, he also take a picture from his side, whereby from his side is uh, more of the demolished house. If you look at the slide four, those are kind of the demolished house. If you collect all this together and we grant it to be in more part of farms and mix together with the rice hoops and put a little bit of cement that can also produce. When we look into the slide uh, six and we were trying to figure out how can we make these things uh, useful and that can attract also other people and the communities will learn all that. And the challenge is to find uh, a suitable and sustainable and cost effective solution to build the homes and critical infrastructures in a different setups. So if you look at the right hand side, uh, the rebuff bricks, transforming wealth today, wealth brick again, this is the idea came out from the, the names we are trying to choose from the uh, yard. And we first look at the broken bricks and the rice whips at the same time, the river sand, this is the raw material. If you mix them together and the knowledge we get from the local engineer so that to compare it be very strong. And if you look at the cement and this is the result when you look at the bricks. So we also designed these so that uh, people can understand. And if you come yeah. down to the slide six, uh, this is the practicals where I've, I'm seated and looking into how when we collect all these broken bricks and we grant and mix together with the rice heaps, then when we get a local uh, manual machine that can lay the bricks so that if you see the wheelbarrow and that's where we do the manual and the measurement was uh, 100 by 100 but uh, the ratio is to one bag of cement that will give all the kind of material so that we we'll make them together free to, to make uh, the, the bricks. So, if you come down and look into the, the final product of the Rebirth Bricks uh, prototypes, and it has taken for us a long way uh, actually to come up with this. If we mix all this material together, and when we lay, it is stayed only like uh, one day. After that, we start uh, doing key wiring that will take us uh, one week so that to give a very fine uh, bricks that you can see it's a grain color. That's the final product for the all the material we collect. And this has given the, the, the real bricks into great use. So from this, uh, we also have a group of uh, refugees that when we are doing this and community so that they can learn how this uh, 
a material when you mix together, it can give the fine blocks or break stone. If you come to the lights, I have uh, this uh, this house at the same time as the bricks because this one we use also the local uh, materials. Uh, we call it uh, uh, F RAM technology. The same idea is the the bath bricks, which consume the same bricks. If you look at this, and it can build a house like this. And this is uh, something I I learned, and uh, I real thank Rob. At the same time, uh, I give yep. my appreciation to Geeks and uh, Toolkit because bringing all the inventor from different uh, part section when we sit together, we talk and sharing idea. More what I learned from is uh, documenting all this thing into a uh, acropedia. This is a new skill that I got from this project. And, and the project did not end yet. We are still uh, in the experimentations because we wanted to look after two years, what will happen to the bricks? Because we we actually make a foundation whereby we dug down, look into if it consumes a lot of water, what will happen so that we also give a fine uh, uh, project uh, so that we can also do later on. Thank you so much. Thank you, from my side, I can say that uh, it was a new experience for me and my team. Um, uh, the main topic of this uh, collaboration for me uh, is about a uh, good uh, uh, cultural exchange. Um, because um, Avuga, which became my new friend, and this is the first person who I know of uh, Uganda and from Africa of all. For the project, uh, I can say that. Uh, oh, I cannot uh, say my screen. Thank you, yeah. Jan, and thank you, Vuga, for the presentation. And um, I guess we all look forward to seeing what happens with the BRICS after two years. So it'll be good to keep uh, learning and watching and seeing um, how that goes and how you implement them using the waste in, in Ukraine as well as in South Sudan and uh, Uganda. Um, and uh, last but not least, we'll hand over to Bodan for um, a video takes us through that PDF platform and then uh, Q&A. So, Bodan, take us away. Okay, so hello, hello, hello. Um, my name is Bogdan. In announcement, it was said that Roman will talk about large printer, but at the moment he's pretty busy. So I will tell you about the project. Let me start of the fact that Roma is a project manager. He is responsible for communication with the gig and solve informal and uh, urgent issues. I thank him for that. So in this project, I am engaged in open source extruder research and development and technical assistance with other parts of printer. So uh, one second, I will share the screen. And uh, do you see it? Cool. Yes. So let's start. Uh, one on. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's start. In August 2021, on my own in initiative, I decided to try large formats for the printing. I rented a homemade precious plastic extruder and a large concrete concrete 3D printer. I have not been able to achieve a good or even sustainable satisfactory result due to the quality of the equipment. The extruder had the drill instead of the screw and the low power motor that it quickly overheated. Uh, and so the, the printer had the bad, con bad, bad control, therefore I postponed this project until better times. So after meeting Roman and talking about this experience, was born a project of a big 3D printer with an, with an, an open source extruder under leadership of the Tolokar. And the main idea of the project is to find the balance between the chip factory elements that are easily assembled together using available manufacturing methods such as 3D printing. 
in order to create a sufficiently powerful and quality extruder for plastic processing, mainly by the additive method. Uh, the initial idea was to test a small extruder on a CNC machine to obtain input data for further development. Active work began in the September when the ordered parts such as screw, barrel heaters, and engine around, uh, arrived. Uh, we get the first assembled example in the of the extruder in the September 2023 and the first print on CNC machine at the end of the September. So next few months, uh, me and Kostya uh, experimented with 3D printed models, types of, of build plates, build plate surface, plastics, shapes, and dimensions. Uh, costs in our team is responsible for the product design and G-code generation in Grasshopper using node programming. And uh, without his knowledge and the desire to figure it out, I would have spent a long time figuring out how to how to make the router can print instead of milling. And uh, we managed to make a small batch of vases uh, as a New Year gift. Uh, to, to 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 active residents of the fab lab uh, called Ostrov uh, to test the viability of the technology and the product uh, and the product. So current progress um, start in we have we have some results as you can see. So Roman was able to arrange with uh, acquaintances to donate us the half finished frame for a large printer that uh, they once developed for a similar project, uh, but uh, abandoned it. Uh, my colleague Vadim uh, agreed to assemble this frame and throw on, throw on the electronics to bring this, the, this printer to life. Uh, Vadim in our project is a very cool technical specialist who has knowledge in, in the field of electronics, mechanics, uh, and ex extensive experience in the field of printing with the thick layers because his old hobby is 3D printing with clay. Uh, the, pr the printer is already 99% ready and we want to make the first test print on it by the end of this week. Uh, so the extruder project is available on uh, in open source on Ampropedia in the telecar section. Uh, this is currently an alpha version of extruder. Uh, it's working, but it's it's raw, but it's working. And uh, there are many ideas for testing and improvements. I hope that by the end of the spring, based on the tests on the three D printer, I will be able to share the new development, like version of extruder so uh, also i want to thank stein from netherlands for his advice on the extruder parts and uh, thanks geek and telecar for supports and thank for your attention follow us on austria platform and me Mahdan. that's all thanks oh thanks it was a very very quick and very straight to the point and awesome so thank you for sharing, and we will follow you, Budan, and uh, hopefully everything goes well with the next uh, steps on on uh, the the printer as well. So very very nice to see. Um, so thank you, and then before we go to the Q and A, I'll hand over to Emilio and uh, go through a bit of the Appopedia, um platform and showcase a bit of how you find these files, where you can get them, and how you can download them and uh, recreate what what the project teams have been working on for Gig and for Telecom. So Emilio, right, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that I had to turn off my camera. I have a bad laptop fan and it's heating up. So uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see, here it is. I hope that you can see this. Um, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I um, showcasing uh, Apropedia's work in this project is, uh, quite a challenge because it's showcasing all of your work, not uh, ours. But so I wanted to um, share some, some thoughts about resiliency in documentation. Uh, first of all, um, I wanted to, to reflect on some of the goals that we wanted to uh, bring into this collaboration. First, to 
think about what is resilience in the terms of documentation, of knowledge sharing, uh, especially in the context of a war, uh, of spaces where uh, access to internet is very valuable. And what do we do in terms of gathering, capturing all of this knowledge from different places and then making it available in the future? Uh, secondly, facilitating the reproducibility and impact. So how does this knowledge translate into physical um, products or projects that are being implemented uh, in Ukraine or anywhere else where they are needed? And then finally, how can we enable future collaboration? Uh, because I, I think this is a really outstanding effort uh, that GIG has done in bringing in people from different parts of the world, uh, enabling um, the collaboration in innovation and thinking about how this uh, process of open innovation can uh, expand into the future is something that we were very keen on exploring. And then some of the considerations in uh, gathering all of this documentation were first, that there's a variety of people that will be looking at this documentation. And I just listed a couple that are you know, technical teams, people who know how to read uh, good open hardware documentation, know about a bill of materials uh, or about different formats for building, but also, people who uh, are parts of communities who are affected by uh, the invasion in Ukraine and need to implement these projects in the future or in general, non-English users that are interacting with the platform. Uh, and then a variety of formats that come in. So many of them are very technical, but some others are media like photos, narratives, that are more relevant to understanding how this collaboration is taking place. So all of this put together um, needs a platform that brings in different aspects of making that is not purely technical. And that's where um, we have uh, collaborated. First of all, uh, in you know using the platform, this is a screen cap of uh, one call that Geek hosted on which we shared how to use Apropedia. Uh, showed some examples of the platform, and then we uh, supported many of the makers who have been uh, documenting on our platform. But also we have been mostly working with Assis um, on thinking about good documentation practices, what are good formats for documentation, and then creating um, some preloaded templates for people to know what goes where and uh, to basically outline different ways of working, different ways of uh, making so that the documentation can be standardized and can be delivered easily. And then another part of the uh, process has to do with the evaluation that our team and Paola, who's here, uh, hi Paola, has been doing lots of work in curating the content, the documentation, expanding it, and also evaluating it to know what is needed, um, creating the technical templates for the documentation. So lots of this work has been done alongside the creation of the knowledge, right? So there's knowledge that's being uh, funneled into the pages of Apropedia, but also lots of working, just enhancing it so that it can be delivered easily uh, to anyone and making it technically also uh, feasible to, for example, extract the knowledge through an API, keywords, etc. So this is the result, 61 pages right now of the whole project. Um, and there are different different uh, materials that you can explore. I have here um, the main page uh, and I, I will paste it on the chat in a moment. So you, from here, you can see the projects. Each of them have um, a specific you know, depending on what was the need of the project, a uh, list of materials, the uh, assembly instructions. So 
the the goal of this is that anyone can come in, learn how to uh, reproduce the project and have the list of materials, the uh, anything that is needed, but also there is um, semantic information that can be used in the future for aggregating all of these uh, materials. And then finally, uh, some lessons learned. First is to think of a platform as a collaboration hub. So no, not necessarily in terms of what technology is being used, but how can we as a platform enhance the work of makers? So if that means, for example, having people submitting videos of how they made things on the field, and then that can be turned into different formats and delivered uh, online and offline, then that is good enough. Um, secondly, about quality documentation and how we can uh, explore the way that we accompany the makers, because um, there's lots of work involved in creating all of these uh, solutions. Uh, so as you know, the more that we can relieve the work from the makers in creating quality documentation and helping them enhance it, uh, translating it and delivering if you, it to if you, them. If you want to, you can. But not um, I think it's super important to uh, enable greater impact for the projects. And then finally thinking about the resilience of this knowledge. First, how it will last um, over uh, you know, time in months, years, but also how it can be delivered to the people who will be using it. Um, and in this regard, we explored a lot of the work of creating printed materials, collections of pages. So for example, um, you can take uh, pieces of documentation, make a selection, and then creating printed booklets that you can just bring into the field or explore uh, offline versions of Apropedia uh, in, in the case that uh, internet is not uh, a possibility in the region. So, so all of this is what um, we've done and we're super excited to see, you know, the fruition of everyone's work. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Emilio. I think those were really great points as well. And I mean, it's about the longevity of the, the knowledge and the information and making sure that we can access it and share it. And uh, Nils, thank you as well for um, your comment about being with people from Ukraine, but also those in Gaza and being able to support with these projects and having this open source platform, Epipedia, to be able to download and take this. And I think, Emilio, what you're mentioning as well about not being able to access the internet, and having this offline is really, really fundamental as well. So um, I guess I'll hand over now to um, anybody who has any questions. You're most welcome to raise your hand and we'll hand over to you. And um, yeah, if anybody has anything to say, any comments, feel free. So please, uh, we have a few minutes still and we'd love to hear from you. Oh, uh, Eric, you had one question for uh, Emilia. So please go ahead with that. Yeah, sorry, just curious if it's standard markdown and uh, uh, Amelia, we can talk about this later, but I'm, I'm really keen to find ways to import other documentation into Apropedia in a compatible format. This looks great. Thank you. Um, it is not. It is Wikitext, which is um, simple, uh, very similar to markdown in how you use it. Uh, so that there's definitely ways of importing and exporting. I, I think Pandoc uh, has uh, ways of translating from MacDoc to Wikitext. Thank you. That was uh, very technical, but glad to hear. <laughs> so any other questions for, for anybody, uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, Andrew, you might have any a question, perhaps. Thanks. The um, I just want to congratulate everybody. I think that the uh, one of the most uh, difficult things in in my experience in my career has been um, in working with engineers is getting people to document. And what's 
what's been impressive about this uh, project, whether it is the prosthetic uh, arm or the um, in, uh, the bricks or the well, all the different components of it. I think that the, the idea that you can now reuse that in other places that um, you've had resource, the gig has mobilized resource to put into documentation. So if I may say so, also congratulations to the donor for being willing to fund documentation because that, <laughs> that, that often is incredibly hard to fund. Um, if, I, if I were to have a question, it would be, um, do you have a sense of how much people should be budgeting in their engineering projects to spend on documentation. Um, this is almost one of those questions like, you can spend as much as you like on it. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'd like to think that for open hardware projects in the future, if you were to have 60% of the funding for the development for the R&D and 40% of the budget for excellent documentation, um, that that, that you know that ratio feels about right to me. What what does everybody else think? May I? Uh, uh, go ahead, cut I the would, tea, please. I would find only documentation. <laughs> that I mean, to produce documentation, you need to produce the work. Uh, so uh, documentation uh, that is replicable, that can be that can be picked up and used by somebody else, is the most important bit in. Uh, in open uh, open design, open hardware, open software, but the same is in uh, it's the academic culture of uh, repeatability of your research. Uh, what, what is what is happening in the recent years is that uh, so many of published papers are impossible to reproduce and impossible to repeat. So uh, I would go even step beyond that. Uh, uh, I would. Uh, fund projects that have two steps of reproduction in them, so that somebody uh, somebody builds a work, builds up on somebody previous's work, documents it, and somebody else goes ahead and builds this after that, verifying that the previous step was done. So, I would bridge actually two steps uh, in uh, in one application in one project and implement those uh, design that from the step like this that. Uh, that would validate that the quality of documentation produced uh, is uh, relevant, and then it's it's actually it's not so much even about the the outcome that the printer worked that the prosthetic uh, worked exactly, but it's at least highlighting, it's at least kind of pointing that these are the potential issues, these are the things that need to be focused attention on the next iteration. This uh, by documenting those problems and documenting those kind of obstacles as important uh, as documenting the successes uh, and encourage uh, kind of reporting not that yeah we, we were able to build this beautiful thing but being able to uh, report that, that uh, yeah this this yeah so so that somebody else could pick up this work and go forward because uh, often uh, the situation that we find ourselves in is that uh, somebody has published a beautiful YouTube video or a published a beautiful paper and it looks as if this is kind of a snap thing. Of course, we, anybody has in, having a 3D printer can build that prosthetic <laughs> uh, and then just kind of communicates, communicates that wrong message. Uh, and what I, would, what I would focus on in this project is exactly that, that it's, it's about uh, kind of gradually contributing little bits and kind of not just build, for example, the whole VM prosthetic, but kind of there's a set of open questions that for the next call, I mean, that ITC communication needs to be resolved or that molding process needs to be improved. Uh, but so it's documenting about, where the structure. challenges are as well. It, yeah. It, thank you. And, and honestly, um, Constantine, you know, preach. <laughs> this is, I, I agree with you entirely. The one thing I would I would ask also, and I have to declare an interest here because I'm on the board of Atrovedia, and one of the things that we're interested in on the board is the impact of um, the you know the the wiki, the documentation on our website. Um, what's happening next with Tolokar? What what's happening next? And do you think there will be an opportunity for whatever is happening next to include some resource? 
to keep track of the uptake of this documentation, how many times the things that have been documented here are made and by who and where. Do you think that what's happening next with Tolokai and do you think uptake is something that we can build into whatever's happening? Uh, I think the person most qualified to answer the question is laughing uh, loudly into the camera now with her microphone being muted. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes. Begin. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, taking the card that nobody wants. Um, Lena, Zara, if you're still here, please jump in. Um, we don't know, to be honest, um, because in the middle of everything, the German government um, had to unfortunately put a stop to all um, their budgets and that is resolved, but it's taking time until it translates into project funding. So we actually do not know at this point and we don't want to raise any false expectations. That said, um, we did get very good feedback on the playbook and the Appropedia version of the playbook. Um, I have to say that I am very pleased that a lot of people understand what was just said by Andrew and Constantine as well about um, open documentation. Oh yeah, thank you, Zandra. <laughs> um, Ukrainian print version is coming as well. Um, yeah, so this has been understood and there's ways of working with that. We would like to, you know, we're, we're pitching right now to a lot of different um, projects, partners, potential new partners, different organizations. And I would like to turn this question around. Um, it's also why I switched on my camera. So we hacked this a little bit, right? So obviously nobody had said, yay, here's money for open source documentation. Um, it's open source documentation for a purpose. And um, that, you all know that that ranges from education to startup support to SME support to um, more circular productions to digital innovation hubs as clusters for things. And so my question would be, where do you see use cases for what, what you did? Who do we sell? the products to or do we not sell a product do we more sell the service of thinking about how to make whatever like make almost anything almost anywhere um in an open source way how how do you see that and that that will be my question back and i know this is not very satisfying and i'm also not happy about that but that's where we are right now Thank Again, you. Lena and Zara switched on their camera, so maybe maybe there's stuff that I don't know. No, there's um you you summarized it perfectly. Um anyhow, um I think um the aspect of documentation and the possibility for um sharing knowledge and building networks is um very important and it's um, very specific to this project and it is something that i'm happy to support whenever we have the chance to so um yeah um i i hear you i um take it with me we collect the ideas now and um I, i'm pretty sure that we will always um put attention to this aspect of learning and um, knowledge sharing um, yeah, that's it, probably. May I chip Thank in Thank you. Constantine, yes, go ahead. Uh, so I think it's actually the important reference point uh, is the the time frame at which these kind of projects work. Uh, and as we can see, kind of uh, the the open academic uh, can, uh, kind of way, way of doing things just takes much longer, uh, is just much slower moving area than, uh, than say 
commercial sector that uh, and industrial sectors that uh, we used to see kind of bringing the change. I mean, we can see how uh, 3D printers now iterate year over year, but uh, it only happened after the patents expired. Uh, so for nearly three decades, 3D printers were there, but uh, nobody was allowed to use them. Uh, so uh, uh, right now, uh, seeing kind of uh, how this these tools and this knowledge uh, kind of we all see the potential of it, uh, but we'll start recognizing how much work it is needed and how much coordination is needed to actually to make to make use of this potential to make use of these tools. Uh, it's uh, yeah, uh, it's just important that that everybody here and. Uh, registers it and communicates it further uh, that uh, witnessing impact of such projects uh, takes take, takes longer time takes uh, uh, this is uh, yeah uh, so we need we need to fund projects that focus on uh, longer term knowledge generation uh, with these tools uh, I mean I just it just recently occurred to me that Niels Fab Academy has been running for uh 26 years, 26 years has been uh, teaching Fab Academy and it's only in the last couple of years that uh, major universities starting picking it up. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I think the work that we have all done together within one year uh, should not be underestimated and we should put all our best effort to communicate it uh, to all potential donors, funders, uh, but at the same time, kind of manage expectations and uh, put focus on the longevity and on the importance of uh, of this work in the in the long term. I can ramble on, but somebody should stop That's, me. Uh, I would just say absolutely, and thank you for all these reflections. Um, because uh, yeah, they are super important um, in our yeah project execution as well uh, to see like how all these collaborations are really taking off and how much time it actually takes to build the trust between people so that they can really collaborate with each other. Um, and I would love to thank uh, Kirsten, Shaima, and Aziz for creating this beautiful event. Um, it's so amazing to see all the outcomes uh, in this first, uh, first iteration and I would hand over to Kirsten to announce next week's um, event and then we can say goodbye. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Constantine, we, you know, we, we hope you join us next week so we can continue the, the conversation. So uh, please do come back next week. So uh, this time next week we'll have uh, a few more of the projects that we've uh, be working on and Aziz will be with us as well as Emilio. Um, so we do look forward to having you there to see some more of the projects that have been put together and uh, continue the conversation and uh, continue to share what, you know, what we've been talking about today and uh, maybe take the next few steps and see if we get, um, you know, a bit more funding, Vicky and uh, friends. And uh, <laughs> we're just saying, but, you know, but uh, yeah, and uh, just uh, thank you everybody, yeah, everybody for joining us and thank you very much, Aziz. And uh, we're just sending you uh, lots of hugs and, and support to to you there and with your family and, and all your friends as well. So just sending that and to all of you guys in Ukraine as well, of course. So thank you. And uh, we'll see you again this time next week for a few yeah, more of our projects and uh, continue the conversation together. So thank you, thank you, Emilio, thank you, Aziz, thank you, Constantine, um, thank you, Vuga, Jan, and also Bowden. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and see you again. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Cheers, everyone.